All right, talking more revolution, more shop. Louisville, assalamu alaikum, it's time to revolt. It's time to get out in the streets, have a peaceful day of protests, uh, starting November 1st all the way up to November 6th, Election Day. We need to have peaceful protests, Louisville. I was thinking about the uh, electoral strategy, a third-party electoral strategy, W.B. Du Bois strategy, okay? So since uh, I'm going to be using the W.B. Du Bois strategy in Louisville, which I think is fitting, especially since we now have the Black Panthers here. So um, Hakeem Muhammad, welcome. So uh, Hakeem Muhammad is here in Louisville now, and we're, we're, we're having a third-party strategy. So by having a, a strong independent movement, we're showing that there's – uh, a, an active fighting progressive population here in Louisville that will encourage more Democrats, more progressive minded people to stand up and speak their mind and we need more people to stand up. The media will, uh, even the left wing gatekeepers uh, will try to stop the third parties from emerging. So I think by having a strong robust third party movement I think we can break a lot of uh, uh, a lot of perceptions in West Virginia. There is that guy who um, got 40% of the vote, the convict, uh, they got a percentage of the vote against uh, Obama. This is during the primaries. Obama again lost <laughs> uh, lost West Virginia uh, race to Keith Judd. Okay, so when Keith Judd won West Virginia, you saw Joe Biden go to West Virginia to talk to them. They know that they can't lose the state completely, and when they're down that behind, it makes them re look really bad. The headlines about what West Virginia uh, will come out of West Virginia, po probably mostly the racists, right? They're a bunch of racists. A lot of West Virginians were saying that they did not vote for uh, Obama because they were black. I watched CNN. I saw that. So... Um, uh, Obama loses 41% of the West Virginia vote, the primary vote, to a federal inmate. So Keith Judd, who's incarcerated in Texas for extortion, he's also a serial presidential candidate in West Virginia's Democratic primary Tuesday. He grabbed 41% of the vote from President Obama. Uh, Republicans are gleeful in embarrassment to President Obama, a federal inmate, <laughs> number 11593051, otherwise known as Keith Judd, won 10 counties. 41% of the vote in West Virginia's Democratic presidential primary Tuesday. Mr. Judge is incarcerated at the Federal Correctional Institute in Texarkana, Texas, where he is serving a 210-month sentence for extortion. According to the Charleston Gazette, Judd has paid the $2,500 filing fee and submitted a notarized certificate of announcement to appear on the ballot. <laughs> He is even qualified to have a delegate at the Democratic National Convention because he won at least 15% of the vote. However, no one has stepped uh, forward to fill that role. So he's he won a delegate, Keith <laughs> Keith Judd, the federal inmate who's in um, Texas, is in a federal correction institution for extortion. So a federal prisoner, Keith Judd, won 41% of West Virginia's uh, primary. And when he won the 41%, that showed that you have power even if you lose even if you lose you have power in electoral politics because you get to control the narrative you get to say well why did 41 percent of people vote for this guy in prison he could be a really good guy but like he's in prison right so automatically it just makes it sound really bad for obama if people are voting for a guy in prison and not voting for somebody that is actually the president now saying that i don't know anything about keith judd so he could have very progressive ideals and uh... Eugene Debs was in prison and got uh, one million votes, uh, one million votes while he was in prison. So Eugene Debs, that's my heartbeat. Love me some Eugene Debs. Uh, he's like a, a Nader before the Nader, or Jill Stein before the Jill Stein. He's just like he's like all of them. I mean, Roseanne Barr, Cindy Sheehan, Cynthia McKinney, Dennis Kucinich, uh Gatewood Galbraith. So there's a lot of folks that have um, that are fighting the good fight on on the left. So the electoral strategy, I think, is a good idea. I think it'll work. I think it's a safe state. There's no reason to vote for Obama or Romney, so that opens the door up for saying how we live in a two-party dictatorship, how they, uh, they're they basically a two-party system. They're both for big business, and both corporate classes, and these are all true. This is all true even in Kentucky, so even amongst the local and state politicians. Um, most of your Democrats act Republican. I don't see any true progressives out there. Attica Scott 
is talked about positively in progressive circles. I know some people have said good things about John Yarmuth. So those are two possible folks uh, to check out. There's also a gentleman uh, by the name of Norris Shelton who's going to be vying against Gerald Neal. And this race is going to be fun. This is going to be a fun race. And I'll tell you why, because uh, Gerald Neal, he's got a lot of progressive things going for him. He's, uh, you know, he doesn't mind talking to the Tea Party. He's, uh, he don't mind going to the, you know, into the belly of the beast to make the speeches. He was a part of the, uh, the Black Power protest. He got arrested for getting the Pan-African Studies Department at UofL. So, uh, and while he's got those progressive measures, he also has... Um, some some issues he's ne he needs to deal with uh, uh, in the state. The state is failing state. We have a lot of issues that um, are uh, we're not reaching the public for some reason. Um, there's also five hundred thousand dollars he got from some place. He's not for democracy. He um, he could be kind of a, an arrogant asshole. He, we uh, voted against having outlines. He was making us do outlines at a whim in class okay I had him for uh, Gerald Neal for class and he was making us do outlines uh, for chapters he wouldn't even test us over and so one day I said hey let's put it to a vote whether or not we want to have outlines or not we're adults we can study how we want to study and if we don't want to do outlines we don't have to so the vote happened and the vote happened in my favor uh, but he didn't count it up or tally it he kind of just dismissed it and pushed it on and still assigned the, the votes anyway so what that shows me is he doesn't actually know democracy, just like Professor Ziegler of the democracy, democracy class of the political science chair. Uh, I don't know who he is, what he is in the political science department of UL, but you don't know democracy. Professor Ziegler, you don't know democracy. You can't teach democracy and be a dictator. Those things are opposites. They're contradictions. And I don't know if you know anything about logic, but a contradiction just means that they, you can't say, you know, I walked to the store today, so therefore the sky is blue. Those are illogical statements. You can't say I'm teaching democracy and I'm going to be a dictator. If you really want to teach us democracy, you would have uh, endorsed that club and you would have shown us how a democracy actually works. But it's not about democracy. It's not about teaching us how to actually learn in college. Um, what the University uh, Louisville, what it was to be taught, what Gerald Neal had taught, and what uh, Professor Ziegler had taught, and uh, several of the other professors had taught, is that they are kings and tyrants and that they are... Uh, they're a delicate genius, right? Using George Costanza's uh, words, they're a delicate genius. And so they're a delicate genius. They're a sage on the stage. They're allowed to get up in front of the class, in front of the podium. They talk their bullshit, and everybody, because they want good grades, just sit there and accept every fucking dumb bullshit that comes out of their fucking mouth as genius. Well, I don't believe in a sage on the stage. I believe in a God by the side. And either you're here down uh, on, on my side, on the bottom, helping me duke it out. You're fighting on my side. Um, or you're trying to dominate over me, and I don't. I, it's so clear to me. I've heard. I've talked to several people, and they act like you know I'm crazy for thinking this. But when you got one dictator, and you got the masses that just sit down and shut up. And I'm going to be an, an educator. You know, I'm going to be an educator. So when I'm in the classroom, I'll understand that power that a one person in front has. They have the ability to divide and conquer. They have the ability to say, Hey, look at me. I have all this knowledge. Just you know worship me and all my knowledge and participate in my conversation just only so it helps my speech uh, be made better. Um, so that contradiction of being the student and then being the professor, I want to learn how to stand up and teach. I did not learn that in college. That's not what I was taught in college. It's basically rote memorization. Just memorize, 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 and that's it. Just rote memorization. Um, and no critical analysis, no critical thinking was done or asked for on our part. Uh, so, so that's a little bit of, of Gerald Neal. It's a real frustrating class to go through, uh, especially since I think, feel like I know a lot about state and local government. I also know um, a good deal about uh, Kentucky history. So those are the two classes I had took of his at U of L. And I actually heard that once you become senator, you can just take, you can just teach classes at U of L. So once you become a representative, then you can become a professor. So that's one path to professorship, win state representative, win state senator, and then you can teach at U of L. So um, yeah, that just kind of shows a little bit to his character. He, he's more of a dictator and more of a tyrant. 
than he is for democracy and discussion and for uh, freedom and and that's frustrating. That's frustrating. I mean, I I don't hate him for it. I don't hate you, Gerald Neal. I'm I just started talking about um, your candidate who's running against him and and he looks like a cool guy, man, Nor Shelton. So the uh, who's going to get me most at between these two? That's what we need to uh, you know figure out. Uh, who is going to solve economic inequality? Who's going to stand up for the people and speak up loud for the people? So, you know, who listens to democratic coalitions? Who are they listening to? Just lobbyists? Just corporate lobbyists? Do they have any citizen groups that they say, you know, stands by them and stands by their side? Or do they have any citizen groups that they go to in order to um, get their opinions? Because my fear would be if I ever became a representative and this is true of anybody, um, so it's something to think about for yourselves and for your own representatives, but if I was to become, you know, in any position, if I become the educator, if I become the boss or the manager or the manager or the, uh, the mayor, so if I become any of those positions, what would prevent me from becoming corrupt just like the rest of them? And I, my solution is to have a working families party, a council, a committee that I always talk to that always keeps me humble, that always keeps me abreast of the issues and keeps me up you know, um, um, like a cabinet, like a close cabinet, not exactly governed by law, but a citizen's group um, that can always, you know, make sure I don't veer off course, make sure I don't veer off my progressive course. I'm for working class families, down with working class peoples. I'm with the 99%. I'm with the homeless. I'm with the poor. Working class, middle class, I'm for, um, if you work paycheck to paycheck, that's the class I'm for. So, uh, being that that's that's the case, you know, whoever gives the working class the most stuff, the most things, the most promises, the most legitimate promises that can achieve change, the most serious promises that can achieve change, the one who tells us the serious stuff that can actually achieve change, not the ones who bullshit us, not the ones who talk to us like we're wonderful and nice and says thank you and shakes our hands, those things are important, but the policies the policies are the main thing. The policies are the most important. So, the third party to boy electoral strategy is key. It is key. Frederick Douglass had this to say about the, the thoughts on slavery. It is partly in consequence of such facts that slaves, when inquired of as to their condition and character of their masters, almost universally say that they're contented. They are contented and that their masters are kind. That's what a slave says. Wage slaves real slaves. The slaveholders have been known to send in spies among their slaves to ascertain their views and feelings in regard to their condition. The frequency of this has had the effect to establish among the slaves the maxim that a still tongue makes a wise head. So since there are uh, spies in their midst, they make sure that they don't say too much so that way they don't get screwed over. They suppress the truth rather than take the consequence of actually speaking it. And in doing so, they prove themselves a huge part a part of the human family. If they have anything to say of their masters, it is generally in their master's favor, especially when speaking of an untried man. I have been frequently asked when a slave if I had a kind master and do not remember ever to have given a negative answer. Nor did I, in pursuing this course, consider myself as uttering what was absolutely false. For I always measured the kindness of my master by the standard of kindness set up among slaveholders among around us. Moreover, slaves are like other people and imbibe prejudices quite common to others. They think their own better they think their own better than that of others. Uh, many under the influence of this prejudice think their own masters are better than the masters of other slaves, and this too in some cases when the very reverse is true. Indeed it is not uncommon for slaves to even fall out and quarrel amongst themselves about the relative goodness of their masters, each contending for the superior goodness of her his own over that of the others. At the very same time they mutually extricate their masters when viewed separately. It was so on our plantation when Colonel Lloyd's slaves met with the slaves of Jacob Jepson. They seldom parted without a quarrel about their masters. Colonel Lloyd's slaves contended he was the richest, and Colonel Jepson's slaves says that he was the smartest and more of a man. Colonel Lloyd's slaves would boast his ability to buy and sell Jacob Jepson. Mr. Jepson's slaves would boast his ability to whip Colonel Lloyd. These quarrels would almost always end in a fight between the parties, and those that whipped were supposed to have gained the point at issue. They seemed to think that the greatness of their masters was transferable to themselves. It was considered 
as being bad enough to be a slave, but to be a poor man's slave was deemed a disgrace indeed. So, Frederick Douglass, thoughts on slavery. Occupy Louisville. Viva la Revolution.